uh, Schellenberger here. Uh, uh, you, you didn't come really this evening or this morning, I guess, to hear me. You came to hear Rav Steindel, so we'll be ste stepping in in a moment. Uh, I trust that you've all met Rav Steindel in a sense. If you listen to the webinars that Arthur Kurzweil gave uh, two weeks ago and that I gave a week ago, uh, for me, I have to say that this is very, very exciting. Uh, for the past two years, I've been preparing various materials for the Talmud Circle and sending it off into cyberspace where I know that it gets printed on the other end and that the outstanding group of educators that uh, Parrot has on his team are studying with you. So I know that that's happening, but I've never actually gotten to see you. And uh, today, as I uh, have been sitting here and waiting for uh, the, the, uh, the video to start working, I have had various glimpses of the group, and all of a sudden it all comes together. It's not just a, um, a text that I'm preparing, um, that I'm going over, but it's actual people who are studying this text, again, with the really outstanding educators that you have. I've had the pleasure of meeting uh, Peretz and the rest of the team on Skype, and uh, we've talked through things. I've gotten feedback from the educators, the opportunity to speak to you, the actual participants, the learners, the people who are most important in the story, is very, very exciting for me. We're going to turn this, however, over to Rav Steinsaltz in a moment. Uh, for his shiur, and then, as Paris explained to you, afterwards there will be an opportunity for you to discuss this amongst yourselves, and then for some questions and answers with Rav Steinsaltz. Rav Steinsaltz? Well, hello folks. Uh, it's, it's interesting, one of the problems of, of having a, a big globe in which we are, on, on which we are living, let's say, uh, for me, it is night. I hope, supposedly, I'm just going to sleep. For you, it is daytime. You are waking up. So, I'll try at least to, to make, if possible, to wake up. Okay. So, we are now dealing with a, with what I call a suya, which is a, a, a piece of, of uh, that is found in the Talmud, but it is not just a sentence, but, but rather it's a collection. It is a complete, complete little, little uh, work or essay in itself. And this is a surya, which means, uh, literally, the surya means a way of walking. So it's a walk. We are walking through it. But it's not a very short walk. So we'll, we'll do a little bit, as much as we can, on our, on our own and together, with a real hope that you will be so tempted by, by tasting it, that all of you will go on and studying further, further on, which is the main, the main purpose. The main purpose is not to be just passive la listeners, but rather active, active, active learners and creators and whatever it is. Okay, so we are now on the <coughs> in Maseret Shabbat in the. See if you have any any kind of of editions. It's usually the first, the first, uh, the first part, the first volume of of the Masechet Shabbat, in page thirty, Lamed uh, A. And we are we are here in a within after after dealing with the Mishnah that that had to do about several things about. Uh, on one hand making fire, creating fire on Shabbat. The other, the other, the other question is, can you, can you put, put out the fire? Now, it is, let me just put it from the very beginning, just in order to think about it. Basically, there are so many things that are prohibited on Shabbat, quite a number of, the, of them. But even though they are, they are, they are partitioned into groups and subgroups, the basic idea is in both of them quite simple. What is prohibited on Shabbat is any, any work of, of physical creation, which means anything that is physical in this with world that is really, really a real thing, not ideas or, or thought. 
but uh, work in, in the way of creative. That's creative work is prohibited on Shabbat. There are basically that is the, that is the main the main idea. And if you get it properly, you you possibly can keep most of the laws of Shabbat properly. In the, now, the, the problem is that our, there are certain certain deeds that we do that are the, the definition. What is is it created? How much is it created? What what is the creative part of it? Is is problematic? Some of these things were prohibited because of rabbinical decrees, not to not to, to do things that are a, against the sense of the feeling of Shabbat, but basically. Was. And we are here now, we are dealing now with a question which is a connected with that, about putting, putting down, putting off a light of a candle on Shabbat. Now, you, to make a light, which is, is, is strictly prohibited, in fact it is not only one of the things that comes from the, from, from the general, general idea of, of what is work on Shabbat, but becomes much more, much more clear when we have a special, a special verse that says, "Don't, don't make a fire on the day of Shabbat." So it's clear, it's as clear, as clear a text as one can see. Now the point, the point is that making a fire, creating a fire, is one thing. This destroying a fire. Extinguishing. Extinguishing the fire, which is, then it, it's a very different question in itself. So it is surely, surely prohibited practically because uh, uh, the, the idea is don't mess with fire on Shabbat. Say, keep, keep the fire, fire burning as it is. But there are all kinds of, of, of cases, and here is, here, here, here is a case which is Subiya. Now, this Subiya is interesting among other things. It is, it takes a few pages, but it is the the important part of it is that it is what what we may call it one of the very few samples of a of a sermon given in in the in, in what I call it, in the in the synagogue or in the in the or in the in the Beit Knesset of those times that. You, you have it a whole sermon from beginning to end. So then you can you can see it is not just a question answer. It is it becomes the rabbi is asked a question. He is not is not just getting giving an answer, yes or no. He takes the the question and make, makes it as a as a pivotal point of creating a, a whole series of ideas. Most of them are not halachic, but what they call agadah, which is the deal with ideas and with other things. And we come, we go from the, from the very beginning, we, we, de we deal with one sp very specific question, but it goes on and be become, become a larger question about the dead and the living. And what, what is more important, the living or the dead? We should be revered more. So these things becomes and becomes and goes on and on and for and inside you have there a, a fair number of, uh, of of questions, questions and answers and discussions until it comes to the to the to the conclusion. So in this case it is permitted. But in, in order to come to that you have here a whole a whole speech. And we'll, we'll begin with the beginning. So, Shaul Sheilta Zo, they ask this question. Now, it, there is a, a strange way, I mean, if you can, can catch the, the, the Hebrew or the any translation, above Rabbi Tanhum the Minavi. To ask a question above him is, is in a way, it, it is just a a, a way of a polite way of, of discussing things. They asked it, this the student asked the question. Now he was the rabbi was as the custom was then those times sitting and the person that asked and sometimes most of the people there were standing. So they were above him. But anyway, that's just a matter of, 
of the, of the, of the style. So they, they asked this question from the, from the rabbi. The question was, is it permitted to extinguish a, a, a candle because of a sick person that is, is bothered by the light, is, cannot, cannot stand the light? So the sick person asks to, to, to extinguish the light, and is it permitted to do so or not on Shabbat? That is the question. So it's in that sense it's a, a simple halakhic question. And it can be answered. Is it answered will be yes or no? That's that's all. Now Rabbi Tanhum is not is not going like this. He is he's opening into a and, and that is quite typical of the of the of of, of that kind of a sermon. We have a, a whole book which is compiled in the many, many uh, hundreds of years later, the Sheil taught, which is made basically of such questions and discussions, and it, be, it, it remained even up to the, say, in a century ago, there were still, still such discussions which were trying to connect not only the halachic answer, but the halachic answer with, 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 with thinking about other sources, other, other ideas, so Together it becomes one thing. So this Rabbi Tanhum instead begins in a kind of a, of a not a not just an answer. He asks kind of a, a rhetorical question. He says, "You Solomon, and it means the king, it means the king Solomon. You Solomon, where is your where is your wisdom? Where is your understanding?" It's a very very harsh way to address the person who is referred to in the Bible as the wisest of all men in the world. So, so he says, and now what is the point of the question? He said, it's not enough that what you say, you, your words, are contradictory to each other, but they are also contradicting each other. Your own words are contradictory in that, in that sense. So you are contradicting your father, which is, it's not a nice way to behave even when that person is as, as wise as Solomon, and surely when you are contradicting yourself, it is, it's much worse. I mean, because, so how can you do it? Now, now so that is, that is the, the statement. And of course, the idea is to make the, the people in the crowd a little bit interested. Otherwise, they, they will feel falling, falling asleep. These, these lectures were usually done on, on Shabbat afternoon. And I suppose, as it is now, even in those times, people had a nice, nice meal on, on Shabbat, and they were rather sleepy at that time. And so they, they come to the synagogue to hear, to, to, to hear the sermon, but uh, well, they have to, to be waken up. Now, this is a question like this makes people steal a little bit. So, so you say, what is the, the, the question? So, your father David said, the dead won't, don't praise God. You are meeting them. The dead, the dead don't, don't praise God. And that is, it's a part of it. In, in one way or another, it is found in, in different songs of, 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 the, of David, in which he speaks about, about, about the, as an argument for asking, for asking the Almighty for life. It, it is, the dead won't praise you. The living can do so. So they, they, they don't praise, don't praise the Lord. And you say, one of your statement is in the book of of a classic. You say you, you praise. You say, and I I praise the dead. That they praise the dead that are already dead, then the living. So it means. Your, your father says that the living are far more important than the dead. The, and you say that the dead are more important than the, than the living. I praise the dead that already died. And then it's not enough that you, are, that you, yes, you can contradict what your father said. You're also self-contradictory because you said after, not a long, a long, in a, a, a long while after saying this statement, about 
I praise the dead that I will have the dead, and says, he gives another statement, which is very clear, for, very, very nice, and very, very fitting for that book. He says, eh, because a living, de a living dog is better than a dead lion. So, so it's not just a, a mere statement about living, a, being alive and being dead, but a very, a very clear, very sharp statement. So, so it's, it seems. So, what is the relationship? We are now, as you see here. As you see here, it is when, when this question it was a, a small halachic question that has to be answered practically. Uh, Rabbi Tanhum raises it into a much more general question about the value of life. Is life more important? Is, is the, are the living more important than the dead? And it is, if one goes on and thinks, thinks about it, it's a part of it is, is of course mentioned here, but there are uh, a fair number of books in, in philosophical books and and the devotional books that deal with this problem about the 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 dead and the living, those who departed and those who are still alive. What is the, the relationship? So it says it it is a is a question that is worthwhile to ponder on. So so uh, no. And then he says it's not it's not difficult. It is it's a way of answering. I raised you before you a question, a contradiction. And so now I am answering. It's not difficult. Because my way of, of, of answering is as, as usual, that the way that uh, in the Talmud do you answer questions, when you have two contradictory statements, you, you usually try to, to resolve the contradiction by saying that they are not speaking ex about exactly the same event or about the same thing. So they are dealing with two different things, and so each, each statement is in place in its right in its right place. So that the the one statement was was about about what the, the King David said: the dead don't praise God. So what is the the meaning of that statement? It ha it is not just a, a simple statement. It also has a meaning. It says it is. It's also a, a something to, to teach us what to, what to do, which, which he says, for, forever, ever, should a person uh, deal, deal and, and, and do, studying Torah and doing mitzvot before he's dead. So as long as you are alive, that's the, the time, that is the right time, the right time to to study and to, to, do, to, do, to, to fulfill the commandments. It's because uh, when a person dies, he is no longer, is no longer dealing with Torah and no longer with his work. And as it says, the Lord doesn't have anything for me. So, as long as he's alive, he's, he's doing something. He's adding to the world. So, so he, makes the, he makes God's world nicer, better, higher. So when he's dead, he's not doing anything. So God, for God is a, it's, it's something deleted. It can be deleted completely. And that is what the same thing, what Rabbi Yohanan was the, one of the, of the great, great scholars of Eretz Israel at uh, those times. What is, what is written, it is written, Bamitim uh, Chofshi, you are, when you are dead, you are free. A person gets the, the real freedom when he is dead because he's, he doesn't have any obligations. See? A living person has some, kinds of, some kind of obligations one way or another in, in life. Being dead means complete freedom. So in, in, the, in a way you can see here that the idea of having complete freedom is not always such a positive thing. And when you wish for a person to have complete freedom, complete freedom means, means annihilation, negation, nothing, death, death. So, so it says that is what, what, what happens. A person becomes free. So, so that, is, that is the statement. When, because when a person dies, he becomes free. 
free of Torah, he doesn't have to learn anything, he's free of mitzvot, he doesn't do any, to do any commandments, he's just completely free. And on the other hand, worthless and useless. So he, he's completely free, but he, he's just a, a spent piece of something of material that is it's not good for anything. So so that is so the statement of the King David about that that in praise of life, in praise of so the, the dead don't 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 do something for, for the Lord. The living, whatever they do, they have they can do it, they should do it. They have at least the chance of doing it. The dead don't have it. So that is what the what the King David says. Now, it goes to the other thing. When the King Solomon says, I praise the dead that already died, that has to be understood. That has to be understood in a, in a different context. And the context is like this. When the people, the people of Israel, sinned in the desert, and they sinned once or twice, so, so the Lord, the Lord, so the Lord was angry at them, and so but Christ says that it should be annihilated, all of them. So then Moses stood before, before the Lord and said all, all kinds of prayers and beseechings before him. And he wasn't, he, he wasn't answered. You know? It wasn't accepted. He prayed that they, it, should, it should be like this, and they uh, possibly said all kinds of things about how, how innocent they are and they didn't mean it and they didn't intend it and whatever one can say. Was, Moshe Rabbi was a great man, possibly had, except for what is written in the Torah explicitly, he possibly added many more things to, to say, but he didn't work. See, he wasn't answered. But when he said then, to, to the Lord, he says, remember to, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Israel, your, your, your servants, immediately he was answered. So this was the argument. <coughs> this was what I call, that's, that, that's the argument that really, uh, one day, one day, the, the discussion, he says, Let, don't, don't speak about them, let's speak about their ancestors. Please remember them, and don't hurt the children. Then it was he was answered. So, if so, it means that if you compare, you have all the living Jews and Moses in, 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 among them, and they are trying to get something from the Lord, and then they, it doesn't work. But what works? The merit of those who were who, who, dead, who died. So, if, if so, is, isn't it nice what what the King Solomon said? I'm praising the dead that are already dead, died. So because the dead seem to be far more important than living. So there is a case in which the dead are more important. They are dead, but their memory, their, their deeds and their merit is outweighs so the, the merit of the living. So this is what one point. Now he puts it in an, in a different a different point, which again should be remembered. The Varachim, another another argument. Another way of, of dealing with it. The, the, the way of the world in Hagoshila, the way of the world, the custom is if there is a if there is a a, a, a great man, a, a so to say Tsar, which is a chief, a chief or a, in our times uh, I it's the right translation, we call him minister of the state, Tsar. Possibly not a chief, but he wants to be a chief anyway. So, so we have if a chief was say flesh and blood makes he makes some decree. Of course, that is what what, what the, the great men do. They give orders and they make decrees and so on. They create rules. Sometimes, sometimes it is obeyed, and sometimes it's not obeyed. I mean, Okay, you have an order, you know, there are all kinds of laws that the, the legislators and others put in the book of laws, and there are all kinds of decisions, and when, when it comes to the people, people sometimes keep them, sometimes don't keep them. That's, 
This is this is the way of the world. Nothing, nothing, nothing new about it. But says, the intention of my If even when you say the people keep this this order, when he is alive, they keep it. When he is dead, nobody keeps it. You see, there was a chief, and the chief made all kinds of orders and made all kinds of rituals. These are kept when he is alive. He's a thief. People, people are afraid or, or respect him, whatever it is, and they keep it. But when he dies, nobody, nobody remembers these things, and they, are, they are just they become they become uh, obsolete at the moment he, that he dies. So the dead the dead chief is no longer a chief. So, but Moshe Rabbein himself, he made all kinds of ordinances. He created all kinds of, of decrees and they stand forever and forever and ever. So he says, look at when you, when you compare people that are in our time, ministers, presidents, uh, secretaries of whatever it is, great men of power, and their power is limited, limited, limited in their lifetime. Sometimes not even in their lifetime. Right? But they are limited. But you see, when you have the decrees of Moshe Rabbein, this is some thousand years past since, and they are still kept. So it means that in this case, if you compare the living, the living chiefs of today with the dead, the dead men of, of the past of Moshe Rabbein, it isn't it nice what, what the King Solomon says? I praise the dead that are already dead more than the living. So, so this is this is this was one point of an of, a, of an argument about praising praising the dead. He says, even though even though uh, we, we said that the dead are not are not doing anything, but on the other hand, the dead leave behind them sometimes, and not just the memory. And a merit, at least they live with a, a living, a living inheritance, a, a, leg a legacy that goes on. So the dead, in that sense, it seems that the dead are far more effective, for, far more powerful than the living. So the, therefore, when someone says, "I praise the dead," sometimes the dead are, I, I have more power, more, more, more authority, more merit than the living. So that was. It was uh, uh, one argument, one argument, and then comes it comes as as a, as we are we have here it's, as we have here it's a, it's, a, it's a sermon. So he put one point for the for the value of the dead against the living, another point for the about, about the dead against the living, and now he puts another the marker, another another. So, what is written, I, I praise the dead that already died. It is like Rav Yehuda in the name of Rav, what he said. Because Rav Yehuda said in the name of Rav, what is the meaning of that? There is a, a, a verse in the Psalms. <coughs> Do for me a sign for good and so my enemies will see it and be ashamed. So David had in his lifetime a fair number of enemies and uh, some of them hated him really, some of them hated him less, but he had a, a fair amount of enemies. And the enemies, the enemies uh, were always trying to, 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 to bring again into, to, to, to remember his wrongs, his mistakes, and many other things that he did, and so when he when he tries to repent, to make him a different life, to make to make changes, he then says he asks, he wants to have some kind of a sign, of a heavenly sign, that will say that okay, the sins of David were really atoned. So, but he wants to see it. He wants to have some kind of a of a sign that will come from heaven. And show that that the, the sins of, of David were, were were forgiven. And he says, 
I want it. So that, that is what was written in this. Now what the, what the rabbi said was, so that was, was uh, and, what, and as he says, uh, uh, so in, in, in detail, David said before God, Master of the Universe, forgive me that sin, because I mean, there were all kinds of little things. The, the sin that is, is always mentioned to it, with, uh, in, in connection with David, is the, the whole series of things that he did with, with taking the wife of one of his officers over the yard. He took Bacheva, who, who was the, the wife of him. He really kidnapped her, and more than that, he also caused her, her husband to be killed. He didn't kill him, but he, he was the cause of it. And that was the big sin that in many ways, except for little, little other things, it is, it is mentioned in the David's, David's songs many a time in which he's, he's asking for forgiveness. He said, I have done, I have done it, but please forgive me. I've done everything to amend, I've done everything to, to correct, I've done many things to change myself. So please, please forgive me. And so, so the, the Lord says to him, it is forgiven. So he says to the Lord, do me some kind, give me some kind of a sign in my life that the sin is forgiven. You say that it's forgiven, but I don't, I don't see any sign that it is so. So it still waits for me. And in many ways, that is, it is mentioned even for, for later. That is exactly what we are. That is the point that is, that is mentioned in the, in, the, in the Bible about the, the David sin. And he wants to, to have some kind of forgiveness that in, in general, in the way that he behaves later, whatever it is, he should be forgiven. He says, and as it was to, he was punished in this world by all kinds of, of miserable happenings that happened to him, to his family, to his children. And he says, isn't it enough punishment? So he says, it's for me, you were punished enough. So he wants to see some kind of a sign for the for me. So then the Lord answers him, in your lifetime, you won't have such a sign. In the life of your son Solomon, I will, I'll, 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 I'll show it to everybody that you will forgive. And then what is the story? Yeah. So here comes the story. So when Solomon built the temple, so the temple was built, and then comes the, the main thing of putting, putting the, the, holy, the holy vehicles that belong to the, to the inside of the temple, to put them in. So especially to put the Ark of the, Ark of the Covenant, which is the most holy, holy, holy object in the temple. So he wanted to bring it in. So he brings it, and so he when he wanted to bring it in to the, to the, to the, to the, to the chamber of the Holy of Holies, the, the gates cleaved to each other. You couldn't open it. So you have a simple you have the king, king Solomon, the priests carrying the, the, the ark, and they have to enter. Of course, they track, they, they surely didn't lock them, the, the gates, but the gates don't open by any means. So, so uh, Solomon said 24 songs of praise uh, to, to ask. To ask the Lord to, to that the gates will be open, and it wasn't answered. So he said, he, he made the songs, and he, he, it was very nice, but the, the gates are still in the in the position. Then he says, what is written in another song, song of David, which he says, "Seu sharim rashichem minasu pitchei olam v'yavu melachakavod." Raise gates. Raise your head and and uh, and uh, uh, elevate yourself. The the gates of the world, and so the the king of honor will enter. So that is 
that is the statement in the in the in the Psalm Psalm 24. So so that's what he what he is asking. And then he says then the gates ran after him to to swallow him. And they said, if you read if you read the verse, and you have to to be to read it and in situ in, in the in the verse itself, because that after that statement, raise gates, raise your heads and open up. So 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 the gates ran after him. And it says, and it says, who is the who is the king of glory? Because it seems as if you are asked, you are speaking about yourself. I am the king of glory, and the gates have to open to my honor. So, so he says, he repeated and says, Hazar Vama, repeated and said, so, uh, lift, lift up gates your heads, uh, be elevated the gates, of, openings, gates of the world, and, and they should and the king of glory will come. Who is the king of glory? God of the armies is the king of glory forever. And still, even that didn't help. <laughs> this song is very nice, but the gates still are stuck. So then he says another prayer, which is which is said in the in the book of King, of the of the of the in the book of Kings, which he says, God, God, the Lord my God, so don't refuse the wishes of you, of your Messiah, of your anointed. Remember the, the merit of David, your servant. And then he was answered. The gates opened up. And then he says, at this time, at this time, the faces of all the enemies of David became darkened, like you see the bottom of a pot. See, they became because because they saw and everybody, all the people, all Israel knew that that God God is atoned him for for, for that sin. So so it means that when when the King Solomon wants to enter, he is not allowed. He wants to bring the ark, the, the, the ark of the covenant, they cannot do it. The gates don't allow him, which means something nothing, something is missing. So the, the ultimate the question, the ultimate prayer is remember the merits of, of, of David my father. He was your servant. And then then the, the gates open, which means that is the that seems to be that is the real symbol of power. See the the merit of the the the, the merit of David your servant. So, okay. And this uh, and so uh, if so, isn't is that nice what the, what King Solomon says? I praise I'm praising the dead who have the dead. I am alive. And I can say 24, 24 so songs of praise. And I can say other things of praise. But it doesn't work. When I, I mentioned the merit of, of my dead father, that, then everything works, which means that uh, the dead are more important than the living. And I praise the dead. And so now he, he, he finishes uh, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the end, just jumps. A, a little piece of the of the of the of the of the statement there and let's and he says what is written in the eighth eighth day, which was seemingly the eighth day of the holiday of Sukkot. When the when the when the celebrations for 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 opening up the, the worship in the in the temple were were finished, then the then he allowed Give permission to the people to go, to go, to go home, and so they they they, they blessed the king, and they went to the to the tents, which means they went to the home, glad and happy. And then the answer is about all the good that God said to 
to David his servant and to Israel his people. So it's a summary that everybody was happy. See, it was it was the King David is uh, of as the as the statement, the statement which is uh, this is part of the of the blessing the moon prayer 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 is the Vid Mel Hisrael Khaikayam. David the King of Israel is, is living forever. So it says this dead man is is still is alive. So it was the, the people were happy that but the, that the glory of David was was apparent in this way. Now it just finishes the, the story. Uh, they came they came to the homes and this, the, the the notion is that they found all of them found their the wives pure. So it means they could come and, and cohabit with the wives. None, none of them was, was confined by any other reason. And smechim, they were happy, uh, glad, because they saw the, they saw the light of the shina blowing on them. Because at the creation of the temple, there is, the, it is an appearance in the, in the, in, in the mist. There is a, a mist and appears. It means that, that you can, everybody could perceive the glory. So that they were happy because all the wives of all these people became pregnant and 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 bore a, bore a son. So so there is another kind of happiness in all the all the good that, that the Lord said did for David the servant and to Israel his people, to David the servant, that he forgave him that sin. Because that, the fact that, that the mention of the name of David opens the gates, opens the gates of the Holy of Holies, means that David is really, is, is remained, I mean, is remained the, the, the person that was sinned and was forgiven. So there is a forgiveness. And what is the, it is Israel more, what is the forgiveness? The forgiveness for the people. It says, they forgive, he forgive them the sin of Yom Kippur because in a strange way, according to the, to the way the rabbis uh, explained the, the text there, it was the celebrations for creating, for, for opening up the temple, the temple of the, were done about the seventh, the seventh day of the month of Tishrei. And then they were celebrating eating, feasting all the time for two weeks running. Now, among these two weeks is Yom Kippur. But for that year, they have a special order and they didn't keep the Yom Kippur. They ate and drank and they were jolly on Yom Kippur as well as the other days. So, when they left, they were some, some, some of them were looking. And you possibly know such people. That's that's very nice. It was a nice, a nice ceremony. We opened up the, we opened the temple, and then we can pray there. Wonderful, but still, what happened with this Yom Kippur? It says they saw that that everything is forgiven, everything is forgiven to in the past and in the present. So we are not at the end of the of the of the subject, but as I said, it is now your turn to go on. To, to take to take the pages and to begin to work. <laughs>